And a, a topic I just wanted to talk about um, was synergies between the high frequency boundary element method, HF, HFM, I'm having an acronym, and geometrical acoustics. Um, and these are two quite well established fields. I think geometrical acoustics is, is known a bit better. Um, so, and, and Alan the bot said a bit about that yesterday. Um, so I'll say a bit about high frequency boundary element method and then I'll, then I'll talk about synergies between the two. So here's an outline. First of all, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of motivation and challenges, get a bit, give a bit of background and just talk about why I'm interested in synergies between geometrical acoustic methods and boundary element method. Then I'll just say what high frequency boundary element method is, because as I say, I'm not so sure uh, everybody would know. It's, it's boundary element methods enriched with oscillatory basis functions. And we saw some other uh, talks on enriching finite element yesterday, which were very interesting. We'll see that these give rise to beam like sound scattering. And then I'll go on to talk a bit about non uniqueness and a new boundary integral equation based on energy. You see a few properties and results along the way, uh, and then I'll just draw some conclusions and uh, that'll lead to some further work. Before I do that, I just want to say a little bit about Salford very, very quickly. So I'm here to talk about computational acoustics, but primarily most of what we're known for is as a research lab. So I don't know if, if you know that or not. I just wanted to, to point it out. Um, so, so I'm interested in computational acoustics, but the bulk of the work that goes on at Salford is experimental. Um, and we're one of the two biggest acoustics groups in the UK. Um, we have acoustic test facilities such as three anechoic chambers, three reverberation rooms where you can also test building elements, sound transmission. Uh, we have all sorts of spatial audio reproduction facilities, including a virtual reality cave with audio. Um, and we also do quite a lot on public engagement, such as this uh, acoustic scale model of Stonehenge, you can see in the bottom right, which was done in conjunction with English heritage. So this is actually laser scans of Stonehenge. This is all printed from. And I think that actually leads into quite an interesting question to start off this talk. Here's, here's the scale model. Um, I current, presently just forgotten what the scale is, though if you go to that website on the bottom right, you can find out. And um, this leads to some interesting questions, actually. You know, what, why are we even doing this? Scale modeling seems like old technology, really, when we've got all these computer simulation algorithms. And the reason is that it's too challenging for current simulation algorithms. Uh, so what makes it challenging? Well, this space is very large with respect to wavelength. So if you have boundary element method or finite element or finite difference time domain, it would be too computationally expensive. But it's also not suitable for geometrical acoustics either. If I take this uh, rather crude finite difference time domain method that simulation that someone did a few years ago, uh, you can see that there's lots of uh, diffraction going on. And then there's lots of re-reflection and re-diffraction of that um, of those reflections of that diffraction and geometrical methods just can't handle that at all. The other thing is that you would have to work with a very simplified geometry for a lot of geometrical methods such as image source and beam tracing. Things would have to be faceted as boxes like they are in this picture. Um, whereas actually the real stones as shown in this scale model are, are really gnarly and there's kind of like quite a complicated um, uh, interplay. You know, it's difficult to draw the line between what is edge diffraction as we classically talk about and what is surface scattering they're, they're really there's no there's a blurred line between the two and that leads to some interesting questions about how you capture scattering from materials and that's something i'm also very interested in and have been uh talking to to gregor and his group about as well because they have some new techniques so there's a little example uh, let's just talk a bit more about motivations for acoustic modeling uh, so I'm mostly going to think about room acoustics and um, in that you might take sound from a source on a stage, fire it out around an auditorium and then and then try and produce um, data for a certain listener position. And if you went back 20 years or something, people, all people would be doing was trying to predict metrics like reverberation time and things like that. But these days, you know, we realise that that information doesn't tell much to end users. And instead, what a lot of people are doing is they're trying to oralize the actual spaces that they, um, they, they, they're considering designing, that they're simulating. Um, so here's a little guy here in a room and he's been replayed sound uh, as if he was in this larger room. And that is exactly what consultants do. So 
a lot of acoustic consultants have these facilities now. Arup was the first with their sound lab. Um, and what they're actually doing is they're playing sound of different rooms to people, to stakeholders. And the, the idea is that the, the guy sat on the chair in the middle is someone who might be making a decision about this, this space, quite a famous space here, um, uh, and some maybe some change to the acoustic treatment or the, the design and the construction. The chap on the left is a consultant facilitating the conversation. And the sound gives them something that anybody can understand. Um, you know, if, if you go to someone with numbers and words and start trying to talk about the acoustics, people kind of blank over. But if you start playing in the sound of different rooms, they can make an informed choice as to what is and isn't fit for purpose. Now, I'm not aware of any um, aeroacoustic versions of this specifically. Obviously, aeroacoustics is important. Uh, acoustics is important in, in, in uh, in aeroplanes, um, but there is a big drive for it in cars. So this was another example, actually. This is a, a sim center uh, in, in Altrinum. So, sorry, excuse me, a sim center in, um, in the UK. And um, here they would play the sound of cars to people. And this would be an interactive demonstration, actually. So a lot of it is about uh, simulating engine noise and, and vibration through the transmission, through the uh, suspension system and things like that. But there is an aspect of acoustic modeling here as well that people would look at sound through these materials as we were hearing about yesterday and try and oralize that and of course the car cabin acoustics plays a part as well so oralization does happen uh, in transport so just take a quick aside uh, and just say what problem we're modeling mathematically well as i say i'm typically thinking about room acoustics that means my air is of uniform temperature there's no flow the medium's homogeneous and isotropic and that means we're actually solving nice simple linear differential equations you're solving Helmholtz equation if it's time harmonic excitation uh, or if you had transient excitation you're solving the linear wave equation and we know that geometrical acoustics methods GA methods such as ray tracing image source as Alan mentioned yesterday work okay in acoustics at high frequencies and this kind of implies that the vast numbers of degrees of freedom used by wave numbers at high frequencies is actually unnecessary for this problem. And as we increase the frequency, we almost expect things to get simpler, uh, at least for early time. So that leads us on to consider how we might uh, simulate full audible bandwidth uh, acoustics. And we need to identify that at low frequencies, wave behaviour is crucial. I've got some instant wave coming in and scattering off this uh, keyboard obstacle here. Uh, we can see some patterns of pressure there. Whereas at high frequencies, sound propagates pretty much in straight lines, approximately geometrically. And you start to identify certain terms and reflections. So you can see some rays bouncing off uh, in green there, which are the first order reflections. And you can see a shadow zone emerge at the back. And these two things are obviously very different. However, oralization is a, a sort of new driver because it requires output data for the entire audible fruit bandwidth all together in one output format so that we can play it to stakeholders. And this gives us some really severe problems because if we use the classical algorithms for low frequencies, the computational cost is rising prohibitively fast with frequency. If you're using geometrical methods, as you come down in frequency, they become more and more approximate. Uh, so so no, none will work for the full audible bandwidth. And the thing that a lot of researchers have done is they've just gone, well, what should we do? Let's use something we know. Let's use a loudspeaker crossover uh, and, and we'll just sort of, you know, sort of stuff these two results together. But that that leads to some more quite interesting questions. You know, is it is it robustly accurate? What happens when you sort of mash these two very different models together? I, I haven't put a slide in on this, but not necessarily nice things. Um, and is it even perceptually adequate? You know, if we're coming from the perspective of presenting sound to people, is is it actually playing them the right thing to make these decisions on? So I'm not sure really that that's necessarily the right approach. But what is interesting is that these are actually all parts of a continuum. And as many people identify, there's a mid frequency problem as well, which is where you're kind of transitioning from one to the other. And you've got an instant wave here. And again, what happens here is you start to see some of these regions of these uh, geometrical type features, these reflections, these shadow zones starting to emerge. Um, but right, so the reflections are showing up as an interference pattern with the instant wave. 
But rather than being very discreet things as they are in geometrical acoustics with hard edges, they're all a bit kind of fuzzy and joined up with diffraction. So that's kind of what I'm going to try and look at here. Uh, is, is that, that's why I'm sort of looking at these synergies. And thinking about how you might actually do full audible bandwidth room acoustic simulation, uh, if you look at geometrical methods currently adopted in acoustics, they distinguish between early reflection time and late reflection time. And this is a little graph here of sound pressure level in a room versus time, identifying certain reflections. And initially they're sparse, you have a low reflection density, you can identify often what surfaces they came off. And then later on, you get into this high reflection density regime where things become diffuse uh, and chaotic as well. And the accepted way of modeling that has been since the 90s is to use deterministic geometrical acoustics method for early time and then a stochastic uh, method such as rare particle tracing at late time. Now, as I was saying before, these are not suitable for very low frequencies. So if you move to a kind of a spectrogram here of frequency versus time, then I'd also point out that modal density is important, that if you've got low modal density, you, you need to use a wave solver like find, them, find element method or find a difference time domain. Um, and whereas at high frequencies, geometrical acoustics is, is OK. And uh, actually, Alan showed a, quite a similar slide to this diagram to this yesterday, but with modal density and damping as being the axis. So it's slightly different, but kind of the same idea. And um, again, this is uh, this is OK, but here in comes our crossover again. What do we do to join these two things up? And in fact, actually, for late time, Maybe that's OK, because because if we're looking at joining up a stochastic model of chaotic system with something deterministic at low frequencies, you're probably never going to do that 100 percent right. You know, you're moving between something that's certain and something that's uncertain. So that's probably the best you can do. But at early time, there's a real problem here, and it's in these early reflections where mismatch between the modeling at low frequencies and the modeling at high frequencies, if you just try and sort of join them together with the crossover, can have some unexpected effects. So I'm kind of really looking at improving things at early time. There's, there's little benefit in running expensive deterministic algorithms here. If, you, if you'd asked me this question, you know, probably a decade ago, I'd have told you, oh, let's just run boundary element method for the entire audible frequency bandwidth. But as I think Martin's going to tell us in a minute, there's much better ways of simulating this chaotic late time region. Um, so I'm really focusing on this early time and I'm thinking that perhaps it would be better to cut things up like this, where you have uh, a deterministic algorithm that covers all of the early reflections for all frequencies and then you, you slice the later time as has, has previously been done. And I'm working on boundary element method. Uh, we've heard a few talks. Um, I mean, Alan yesterday and, and Martin in a minute talking about uh, boundary based uh, or surface based geometrical acoustics. That's what it's called in a survey article. Um, and this gives you a nice common framework as boundary in schools. If you used high frequency BEM for early reflections, uh, something like DEA uh, for late reflections uh, or radiosity. Uh, and then use boundary elements at low frequencies, then this would all fit together in terms of being modelled on boundaries. So just to just to reinforce that a little bit, um, make some comparisons. Uh, so say if you if you've got a high frequency geometrical acoustics model, uh, we assume that sound goes in straight lines. So if you have an instant wave coming and hitting an obstacle, we would find that we get uh, the total solution be the sum of some rays and beams. So we get some reflective waves off those front surfaces. We get a shadow zone. And as Alan said yesterday, this could be energy or it could be pressure computed with phase. We get a computational cost that's independent of frequency here. That's why they're so good at high frequencies. The cost scales with reflection order instead uh, for this, which is one of the reasons I'm concentrating on early reflections here. Um, and they're fairly accurate for high frequencies for most scenarios, but as I say, they're inaccurate at low frequencies due to absence of diffraction. If you're modeling low frequencies, you have domain methods uh, such as finite element method on finite difference time domain, uh, where the wave behavior is modeled by discretizing the medium and computing how cells interact. So if you're going to keep the uh, 
elements small with respect to wavelength in all your dimensions, you're going to get a number of degrees of freedom scaling with frequency in 2D uh, or frequency cubed in 3D. Um, but the cost only scales with the degrees of freedom, uh, and that is because you're only looking at kind of interactions between nearest neighbours in elements. And um, there's a couple of other slight issues with these sort of schemes, um, which can be mitigated by high order schemes, but you can get problems to do with numerical dispersion or pollutant, pollution error as you go to bigger models and higher frequencies. But the main point that I want to make and why I've shown this here is that they're very different to geometrical algorithms. Geometrical acoustics algorithms consider reflections off boundaries, finite element method and finite difference time domain uh, it is about elements next to each other in, interacting. So not, not similar at all in the structure of the algorithm. In contrast, if you look at boundary element methods, uh, then we discretize the surface into elements and the solution is a sum of waves or reflections radiated by all those elements all summed together. So immediately you've got something that's more like geometrical acoustics. The solution is being radiated off the boundary out into space like reflections are. The problem is that none of these terms individually looks like the geometrical leading order behavior. You've got a small element, uh, it just radiates either a bit like a monopole or a dipole, depending on which of the um, boundary conditions you're using or the formulations you're using. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they don't produce things that look like beams. We instead, we rely on a matrix solver to put them together in the right combination. As I showed on the earlier slide, if you wind the frequency up, you do get um, reflections that look like beams and shadow zones and things, but it's from the interaction of lots of elements working together. Another, another benefit when winding the frequency up is that uh, there's no no known dis numerical dispersion error effects in bound jump method because you actually insert a, uh, an ansatz and a solution of the wave equation uh, as the Green's function. So that's quite a long introduction, but that was that was my introduction. Uh, so it brings us into the main structure of the talk here. Where I'm going to talk about synergies between high frequency boundary element method uh, HFBEM and geometrical acoustics GA. And I'm going to do this a bit like a jigsaw, so uh, I've got a whole uh, little ones here, um, so you don't need to worry about reading them all now because I will read them as we go through. So let's focus on these first ones, GA1, first of all on the left. So two of the features, as I've kind of said already, is that the solution for geometrical acoustics is an instant wave plus a sum of reflections, and all of these can have shadow zones cut out of them where the, where the, where the wave isn't visible. So let's go back to this diagram. Uh, so here we have these reflective waves in the shadow zone. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show some animations as if these are phased beams. So I'm going to use this sort of phased pressure version of uh, geometrical acoustics. Um, so what I have, if you think of the pressure at a certain position, it's going to be some amplitude of some particular beam times a visibility function V times a plane wave with a unit direction vector D. And I'll plot this V quantity first of all. Um, and I'm going to do this first of all for the instant wave. So here we can see D inc, the direction vector coming in, showing us which way it's going. And we show a visibility function, which is yellow for visible and green for invisible, um, just plotted there as well. And that shows us that, of course, we get the shadow zone behind the obstacle and actually inside the obstacle, of course, as well, because the wave doesn't go into the obstacle unless you want to model it like that with one of your porous material models. So that is our air domain model of the instant wave. As I say, shouldn't go into the material because we're only modeling the air domain. There it goes. Now onto the reflection. So let's look at the one off the top. There's its direction vector, there's its visibility function, and it will go out rather like that. Same thing for the one on the left. There's its visibility function, there's its vector. It will go off rather like that. And if you put these all together, you'll get this pattern. And because I'm using phase beams, we now see some kind of interference patterns there, uh, which you wouldn't see in an energy method, uh, which is just due to these plane waves and the reflections overlapping. But you can clearly see where the boundaries are between these reflected waves and these shadow zones. So that's P total is P inc plus P top plus P left. And 
my point is just how biogermant method does the same thing. So what about if I did a high frequency approximation to BEM? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot, still plot geometric propagation as in without any diffraction. Don't worry, diffraction will arrive shortly. Um, and under this assumption, the total pressure will be unchanged from geometrical acoustics. But what I want to show is how boundary method decomposes the terms slightly differently. So boundary method uses two terms. It uses the incident wave, which is the, in, the pressure of the wave defined without the obstacle present. So it's in the absence of the obstacle. And then we have the scattered wave, which explains how the obstacle changes the pressure. So let's look at the instant wave. If you're doing boundary element, well, this is this is exact. And what it is, as I say, it's the wave in the absence of the obstacle. So same D ink, but visible everywhere. And there it is. It's going it's coming down and it's passing straight through the obstacle as if it wasn't there, as, as is defined. So we need something to stop that, um, create that shadow zone and stop the wave from passing through the obstacle. And one of the components that's going to be in the scattered wave is something that I will call a shadow wave. And you won't hear many people talk about this uh, because it's not very obvious in frequency domain boundary element method. But if you look at time domain boundary element, you can really see these things coming out. And it's obvious that they come off the back of the front illuminated surfaces. Um, for anyone familiar with boundary element method, if you're doing a, a jumping ahead slightly, if you were doing a, a rigid model of the obstacle, you'd have dipole distributions on the front surfaces. Uh, they have a negative back lobe, and this is what they're producing. Uh, this is where it's coming from. And this is actually going to create an antiphase wave with the same amplitude as the instant wave going out from the back of those front surfaces. So it's going to behave like that. Then we get the reflections off the front surfaces, which, which for anyone who's familiar with the method, comes from the positive lobe of the, the dipole functions. And that would give you these two waves, same as defined before. And the thing to point out here again about these dipoles is that if you look at those front top two boundaries, they have opposite polarity across the front top of those two surfaces because they rose from dipoles. And of course, if you <clears throat> put that all together uh, with um, the Total pressure, you get the same things we did for the geometrical method, but the point is that the scattered wave uh, is this quantity that's got this shadow term in it as well. So, go back to our jigsaw, uh, you can see that uh, Bowdrellant method decompress decomposes pressure a little bit differently into instant plus scattered. Um, but actually, what we get is we still get these shadow zones, but there is caused by shadow waves with opposite polarity that cancel out other waves and create these shadow zones. OK, so that's our first little match. On now to the second one, uh, that reflections propagate outwards from a boundary uh, and the terms in the solutions are directional. So this is about directionality of scattering. <clears throat> and as I said, boundary element method solutions are built for monopole and dipole terms. And both of, both of these are only weakly uh, directional or omnidirectional. In contrast, the geometrical acoustic beams we just saw are extremely directional. And the question becomes is can boundary element method produce directional beams with the diffraction put back in as, as you would expect? And to answer that question, first of all, I'll just say a bit about the boundary element method solution process. So here we have our obstacle. The normal thing is to define an element mesh on there where elements are small with respect to wavelength. And then we'd use often piecewise polynomials on there, maybe piecewise constants or piecewise quadratics. And this would give us a number of degrees of freedom that scales with frequency in 2D or frequency squared in 3D because uh, we're only discretizing the boundary. Um, so that is better than finite element method or FTDD. However, when you set this thing up, you find that the computational cost actually scale, scales with the number of degrees of freedom squared. So order frequency to the four in 3D, uh, which is not good at all. And the reason for that is that every element talks to every other element. If you look at the interaction matrices, you don't have a local uh, interaction anymore like we did with finite element method or FTDD. 
everything interacts with everything over a distance. That's where this degrees of freedom squared comes from. Uh, and this can be tackled with modern matrix solvers, so it's not uh, that prohibitive. Uh, I've certainly done simulations myself with a package called BEMPP, where you use um, H matrix compression, and that gets the computational cost down from order F to the four, back down to more like order F to the two. Um, so this isn't a game changer, uh, but if we can do something about the degrees of freedom, that would that would be good. And so that's what I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at reducing the number of degrees of freedom. And rather than sell these elements, I'm going to sort of more abstractly say that this is the discretization scheme. And rather than using elements, I'm just going to say it's a weighted sum of basis functions. So here I have pressure total as a summation. Uh, I've got uh, over two reflection orders here. It's going to be convenient for me in a minute. Um, often people will just do one, but I'm doing two. And I've got some coefficients W and some basis functions B. Uh, so that is my discretization scheme without saying too much about how they're organized. Um, and then the other parts of this, to draw a little flow chart, is we have what I will call the scattering integral, um, which is the main boundary integral formulation of BEM, which says how uh, scattered sound goes out from the obstacle. Uh, obviously, it doesn't just go to the right. I'm, I'm drawing a flow chart here. And it goes out to other receivers. It also comes around and goes back to the obstacle again as well, which is where we get that degrees of freedom squared from. And of course, we have instant sound arriving from the source to excite this thing if it's a scattering problem. Um, and we need a testing scheme of some type that maps this incoming scheme onto the incoming sound onto the obstacle. So that's the kind of structure of boundary element method. Um, Usually what people do is set this up as a matrix equation in, and invert it, but actually you can solve it by going round and round this loop in an iterative way, uh, as I'll mention again later on. Um, and that's how time domain boundary element solves it actually. It has various problems, but you can do it like that. While we're on this slide, I'll just also just introduce the equation for the scattered pressure. So if the scattered pressure is um, I've just written in shorthand here using these uh, operators that are common in, in boundary element method. Um, so D is the double layer potential. What that means is that the pressure on the boundary is radiating like dipoles. And then S is called the single layer potential. Uh, and that means that this other quantity is radiating rather more like monopole distributions on the boundary. Um, and um, this quantity here, DP by DN, is the spatial gradient of pressure normal to the boundary and that's proportional to particle velocity flow through the boundary so you can think of this rather like being uh, air kind of emerging from the material into the media and radiating on the directionally and that's our, our framework we're gonna have to stick with that but but the question is can we do all this with basis functions which are more like the phased beams appearing in geometrical methods well, yes, <laughs> it's a short answer. So let me explain how that might be done. What we will do is we'll use oscillatory basis functions. We saw that the beams in geometrical acoustics were oscillatory functions in certain directions. We're going to try and discretize the surface in a similar way. And when I say HF BEM, high frequency BEM, what I mean is that rather than using polynomial interpolation functions, we're going to try and build the expected oscillatory behavior into the basis functions with oscillatory functions and therefore allow much larger elements. And the usual motivation to try and reduce the way in which you need more elements and therefore more degrees of freedom as your frequency increases. Ideally, you're aiming to remove the dependency on uh, degrees of freedom on frequency altogether. And that has been done for models of very simple obstacles like spheres. You can do a boundary element or well, boundary integral model of a sphere with with uh, a constant number of degrees of freedom, irrespective of frequency. And the usual form of this would be that the basis function is some sort of envelope function, EN. Um, and, and here I'm using N to index sort of which panel or which face or which sort of envelope I'm using. So this is a bit like element, but very big with respect to wavelength. And I'll have an oscillatory function, O, O for oscillatory. And there's two indices here, because not only may they be different on, on different faces, but you may have more than one of them on a face. So I've got a Q for direction here as well. And 
The intention is that only the envelope of the surface pressure is approximated by EM. So if you had a complicated function like the one on the left, oh, someone just spoke to me, got some noise. Um, then, oops. Uh, then this is the product of two things. It's the product of an envelope and some oscillation. And if you can, if you know the oscillation, the function in red, then you only need to approximate the uh, envelope with uh, conventional polynomials or whatever. Uh, and that is slowly varying and you don't need anything like the same density of elements. So the elements in principle can be much larger. However, this requires a good choice of the oscillatory function. So, so choosing these oscillatory functions um, is very important. It'll actually make the approximation worse if you choose them badly. And a common choice is, is plane waves, uh, in which case we naturally end up talking about wave directions like I had in my geometrical animations a minute ago. Uh, I've also looked at cylindrical waves as well. So as a bit of a quick aside, um, some previous work in the literature on choosing wave directions. Uh, in boundary element method, basis functions, be they elements and polynomials or whatever, are usually chosen a priori in advance. And there's two schemes for doing this with oscillatory functions. Uh, one is called partition of unity boundary element method. And in this, you see the wave directions uniformly spaced in angle. This has the benefits that no detailed knowledge of the problems required. Uh, the schemes independent of source position, but it doesn't break the link between frequencies and number of degrees of freedom. Instead, it gives a significant but fixed a sort of scaled improvement. You need about three degrees of freedom per wavelength instead of about eight. Um, alternatively, you can do what's called hybrid numerical asymptotic BEM. And uh, in this, the wave directions are chosen by hand to match the leading order directions in a geometrical model. And this breaks the link between degrees of free, between frequency and required degrees of freedom. Um, I mentioned the sphere problem a second ago. I'm going to show another example just now. But this requires detailed understanding of the problem by the person formulating the scheme. And the scheme is dependent on the type of obstacle and on the source position. So let's just see a quick example of that. Uh, this is from uh, 2007 uh, from Sam Chandler-Wild and Steve Langdon, uh, who were then at Reading. And um, if you've got an obstacle instant sound, what will you do? Well, you know, on these illuminated faces, you're going to get roughly pressure doubling. That's what happens at a planar boundary. So we'll put that in first of all. The question is then what should the other terms be? And I was talking about uh, waves off, off the um, of the faces, but actually they can be found by integrating this 2p inc term, actually. That's the basis of the physical theory of, well, diffraction. Um, so what's missing from that? Well, it's the diffraction from all these other corners sort of around the back and how they all interact with one another. So let's try and set up an approximation based on this. Uh, and if we zoom in on that top edge, uh, we can see that what we'll have is uh, we're only trying to discretize pressure on the edge, of course, and we've got these two terms at these corners we know are going to radiate uh, diffraction. So we can say that either we're going to have some sort of right traveling wave going with the edge vector with some spatial distribution A, or we're going to have a left traveling wave going with minus the edge vector with some other spatial distribution B. And we'll do that and we'll do it for all of the edges. Um, so of course these are going to be different based on the edge direction. They're all going to have their own um, uh, A and B distributions. And then we approximate these A and B distributions instead of P total. And there's a bit of subtlety to do with using graded meshes, uh, but essentially this works really well. And the reason it works really well is that if you've got diffraction going kind of clockwise from any corner, it will always continue to go clockwise. It will always map onto those uh, same basis functions. It's always going either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Uh, so any diffraction terms from any diffraction order will always map onto that approximation space we just saw. Uh, so it works really, really well. Um, and Steve and Simon showed that you get, you require the, to maintain accuracy, you require the degrees of freedom scales with the log of frequency rather than frequency, which means your interaction matrix has order log squared frequency. And that's gonna give you big savings for this class of obstacle in 2D.
However, moving to 3D makes things a lot more complicated. And myself and Steve did a load of work on that and it was very complicated. I won't present that now. Um, so, oh, partition of unity bound to element, on the other hand, uh, would still use elements. It would still use polynomial basis functions, but we choose wave directions just based on them being uniformly spaced. So you get quite a similar kind of looking equation, but as I've said before, the degrees of freedom still scales with frequency like regular BEM. Uh, there's also problems to do with matrix conditioning with this as well. Condition numbers around 10 to the 15 are not uncommon and you require special matrix solvers. So is there a better way of picking wave directions that makes this all work a bit better? I'm coming back to ray tracing. I kind of have this idea of using canonical problems as building blocks, because if you think of a ray reflection off a boundary, it's rather like a plane wave reflecting off a flat surface. We just didn't think about the fact that the surface was finite. Uh, and here what we see is we have incoming and outgoing terms, and that's going to be important in a minute. Um, and this happens for planar surfaces. We get these incoming and outgoing plane waves or rays. Um, but it also can happen for cylindrical surfaces or, or for edges and corners as well. And um, I consider the two cases on the right, not edge diffraction in this 2018 paper, which is what I'm just going to talk about a little bit. So what's my choice of oscillatory functions? Well, I'm going to prioritize wave direction by a boundary tangential wave number, KT, and you'll see this sort of thing in DEA as well. So I've got my basis function, which is the product of my envelope function and my oscillatory function. And um, if this is uh, if this is on the boundary, then you can parameterize that by some length coordinate. Uh, and if the boundary is planar, then that's just going to be a, a sort of like a scalar product with the boundary tangent vector relative to some phase point. Um, so what you're going to get is something that looks like this. It looks like a plane wave just with uh, the but not at the wave number in the domain at this tangential wave number instead just along the boundary if you're doing circular boundaries you get something similar where uh, you're kind of looking at the angle around the boundary and the radius a of course comes into play as well so you get something that looks rather like that so let's look at scattering from one of these single basis functions is it going to be like a geometrical beam well there's two ways you can interpret your, or use basis functions on a boundary. One is that it represents pressure jump across the boundary, and that means it radiates like a distribution of dipoles. This is the first of those terms in the in the scattering integral. And if you let that run, you'll see that what happens is it's coming off the boundary and it's going in two directions, which are symmetrical from one another, in and out. Um, so we're getting some sort of beam-ish behavior. It's mostly going in some dominant directions, but it's going in both of them. You can also see if you look carefully the pressure side is flipped across the boundary uh, because it's coming from dipoles. Alternatively, um, if you do this with monopole distribution, then you get something that's symmetrical. You still get it going off in both directions. Uh, as I just mentioned here, this simulation to for KL equals 30, where L is the length of the panel. And the tangential wave number is k over 2, so we're getting a kind of cos 30 degrees thing going on here. Um, so both these waves propagate in two directions, one incoming and one outgoing simultaneously. But if you look at thinking about synergy with GA and these kind of reflections versus these shadow waves and things, they need to be separated. So how do we do that? Well, this is, we use something called Dirichlet to Neumann maps. And as I say, the, the kirchhoff helmholtz boundary integral equation, this scattering integral, is capable of radiating waves only inwards or outwards if we use both of these terms, uh, the, 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 the double layer potential D and the single layer potential S. Um, and presently, we're using basis functions to interpolate pressure. So we know they tell us a component of total pressure. So, so they kind of work naturally with the dipole terms. Um, what this equation at the top is suggesting is that we need to know the corresponding dp by dn if we're going to get wave to only go in or out. And a mathematical uh, tool called a Dirichlet to Neumann map gives us this. It gives us dp by dn um, from a certain pressure distribution P uh, 
and it does that on the assumption that P is an outgoing wave. Now this is quite an area of uh, development in its own right and there's there's various complexities here and, and one of uh, Gregor's colleagues has done some, some good work on it as well. Um, but for these cases that I'm looking at, they're quite simple. If, you, if you've got a planar boundary, you can we know this thing's a plane wave and we can just work out what the out of plane wave number is. Um, and that is this term Kn. I'll we'll get an echo from somebody there. Um, which is surface normal component of wave number. So we just sort of do a Pythagoras and subtract off uh, kt squared from k squared in the domain. And that means if we wanted to work out the Dirichlet to Neumann mat was, uh, taking the derivative normal to the surface, it's going to be like multiplying the basis function by i k n, if the uh, envelope function is constant. For circular boundaries, it's kind of similar. I won't, I won't, um, I'm going to skip to the next slide. It's basically just more Hankel functions. So what do we see? Well, if we use the, we set up a, a scheme where we have the dipole operator and then the um, single layer potential monopoles applied to the um, Dirichlet to Norman map, which is going to give us the required dp by dn from the basis function. What you get is that the wave only goes outwards. Um, so it's just going in this outward direction. So we're getting an outward outgoing wave. In contrast, if we flip the sign of that second term, what we will get is an incoming wave instead. So I'm using plus and minus to distinguish between these two. And this has neg neg negated polarity automatically. It's automatically a shadow wave. Um, so actually it fits really neatly into this framework I was saying before. And actually it turns out these are more efficient to integrate as well. So this was something I looked at in 2016. So if you look at the scattering from one of these basis functions, you can actually show that it's, oh, so which naively would be order F squared to compute in 3D. And actually it's a geometric beam plus a correction term, which can be expressed as a edge integral around the element. Um, and that's only order F to compute. So you can actually do them quicker this way as well. So here's our um, little picture again. I'm aware I'm keeping an eye on the time here a little bit. The latter part of this is much quicker, so don't worry. Um, so the first thing is that terms in the solution are directional. Um, and what we see is that oscillatory basis functions cause beam forming. So that actually we can see the same thing in the leading order with boundary element method. Uh, just with single basis functions as well. We also see that Dirichlet to Neumann maps allow incoming and outgoing wave separation. And we've seen that these shadow waves propagate with some negated sign. Finally, we've seen that reflections propagate outwards with amplitude and phase. Uh, oh, I didn't say that actually, so I've changed the order of my slides. Uh, I think that's just coming up in a second. Reflections propagate outwards with amplitude and phase. It depends on the material. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, so on to the third point is that reflections propagate in a single direction. Um, and more, we've kind of seen that a little bit already, but the more important point is, let me just see whether I can find that slide on boundary conditions. Where's it gone? Oh, there it is. Um, OK, yes, it is coming up. Uh, but the more important here point here is that the direction of the sound arriving at the boundary is known. Um, so let me just see if I can explain what I mean there. So here's our BEM solution process again. So far I've been talking about the scattering integral on the right hand side. How, what if you put certain oscillatory basis functions into the discretization scheme, what do you get scattered? Do they look like beams? The second question is, can you actually map the incoming sound on the left onto things that look like that, onto these oscillatory basis functions? What, what, what does that mean? Um, Oops, and if you use a Galerkin BEM formulation, uh, you can see that the scattering integral has a kind of physical analogy, rather like a loudspeaker array performing uh, beam steering radiating sound beams. Uh, people do this in practice in acoustics called wave field synthesis. And the testing integral ends up looking like a microphone array that's looking for sound from certain directions. So 
In geometrical acoustics, the direction of sound arriving at the boundary is known exactly. If you have a ray or a beam arriving, you had a geometrical representation of it, so you know exactly what its angle is. And you do this marching on in reflection order. Rays go out from surfaces, they hit something else, you work out what the angle is, use some boundary data information, and then you work out where it's going to go. Can we do similar for high frequency boundary element method? So rather than define the wave directions a priori, can we find them at each reflection order? And this is rather like using the sort of microphone array analogy of the Galerkin testing integral as, as a way of performing beam steering to look for certain directions. And going back to the reflection, reflectance boundary condition here, you would look, uh, you'd have this sort of effectively a simulated microphone array on the boundary looking for waves from different directions. You would then find that you had an obstacle material model that defines how incoming waves map via some to, to outgoing waves and this could be done via a scattering matrix perhaps uh, or, or coupling to one of the uh, sophisticated models that you have been developing. And then it gets radiated out in certain directions by this loud speaker array. And um, So if you're doing this with a, I'm going to concentrate on the microphone array on the left here. If you've got a wave coming in and you actually have an infinite plane, so you've got an infinite microphone array, then how's this going to work out? Well, the testing integrals end up looking rather like this. You have the instant wave at different positions along the boundary, and then you have an e to the minus ktx term, where kt is the um, tangential wave number uh, that you're currently looking for. We're going to find the amplitude AKT of that wave number arriving. And this, of course, has the form of a spatial Fourier transform along the domain. Um, and we know that if you 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 do something like this, that if if uh, because P inc also has this e to the ik uh, x dependency, then what we'll actually get out of that is a delta function. If the if the surface is infinitely long, uh, you'll get pure plane wave detection and then re-reflection. -re from plane wave instance. So actually the maths all works perfectly fine if the if the surface is infinite. What happens in practice though is that they aren't infinite. This is going to get cut off and truncated. And uh, we get the same integral, but now rather than being over an infinite domain, this spatial Fourier transform is over a finite domain, just the support of this particular element uh, or envelope function or panel. And that's like introducing a window function wx into our Fourier transform. And, and in this case, if you just snip the boundary off, it's like it's a rectangular window. And as many people know, this is a very wide in, of course, in signal processing and things. The Fourier transform that gives you is a sync function. So you're, you're, you, you get the kind of main lobe at the direction that, that you should. Um, but you, what you instead get is sort of, sort of a kind of really clean identification as you do in geometrical acoustics you get some smudging um, and you get a lot of side lobes you get some sort of lobe width um, and this is narrower if you've got a wider boundary segment or if the k in the domain is higher for a given panel size and as is well known again in, in many areas of signal processing and microphone arrays you can perform windowing you can come up with a better choice of this window function uh, artificially um, to to improve this. This is like changing the envelope function. And if you do this, normally what you'll go is from something with side lobes on the left uh, to something that's much cleaner with no lobes. If you use something like a hand window, a raised cosine envelope that's smooth instead of something that's discontinuous. And that's fine. Uh, but what we also see here is that we have front back confusion. We don't know whether the sound is coming from outside the material or inside if we're just sensing with uh, pressure sensing, effectively using monopole microphones. And what I then went on and did was, was look at a more complicated formulation where you introduce not only monopole sensing, but sensing the pressure gradient in a certain um, ratio. And this um, can also be interpreted as using the Dirichlet to Neumann map in the testing integral as well. So, so when you're looking for a basis function from a certain direction, you're not only looking for the pressure that matches with it, you're looking for the pressure gradient that matches it. 
And uh, this has some interest in energy interpretations. Uh, and there's, some, there's a term called cross intensity that I've published other work on that kind of discusses this in more detail. And rather interestingly, this gives you a nice reciprocity between the testing integral and the red scattering integral. You actually find that the testing into Galerkin integral actually looks like the Helmholtz boundary integral, sorry, the Kirchhoff Helmholtz boundary integral equation as well. You, you actually nest in the integral equation in itself, which is quite interesting. You get a res reciprocity relationship. And it also means that the benefits of windowing can be applied to the oops to the radiating wave as well. Um, very quickly, because I'm watching the clock, um, related to this idea of input output sensitivity is non uniqueness and conditioning. Um, I can explain this to, if anyone wants me to later, but we see that with these schemes, um, conventionally, if you go around a resonance of a cavity, which is the vertical dotted line, you'd see a peak in condition number, but both the standard regularized formula relation like the Burton Miller dashed orange line and this formulation using the uh, Dirichlet and Neumann map in the testing integral, the yellow line, give you constant condition number that, that rejects this cavity resonance. So last little bits, um, reflections propagate in a single direction, but well, we kind of already saw that. Um, can the direction of sound arriving from the boundary be known exactly? Um, well, yes, it can with a kind of microphone array analogy, but we see that the finite boundary aperture effect gives some smudging in direction, uh, both in terms of what is radiated out and what is sensed in. We see that smooth spatial windowing can help this. Um, and as we saw before, that can be written as a geometric term plus a correction term. Last two little things um, in the last minute or two. First is that the solver marches on in reflection order. Well, this actually already happens for um, time domain boundary method. If you launch a uh, pressure part from a source to hit some elements, you will find that it kind of goes on in reflection order and reflections caught that wave will cause reflections and then those other waves will cause re-reflect oops re-reflections re um and the this formulation when you use incoming and outgoing waves will allow that for frequency domain band as well very final point is that propagation paths from boundary to boundary are sparse um so in um in geometrical acoustics, propagation is sparse. You'll see this in, in the um, operator, the DEA operator that Martin will show you in a minute. Uh, an array from a given start direction, start point in a given direction will go off and hit a single endpoint on another boundary. But as I've said before, boundary element matrices are typically full. The number of degrees of freedom scales with degrees of freedom squared. Um, so, so this, does, this doesn't hold. Everything goes everywhere in a BEM scheme. But that's because the radiation from single elements is almost omnidirectional. If you introduce oscillatory functions, you get kind of beam forming in certain directions. And what you find is that um, most of the coefficients are very small. So this is a histogram versus wave number for the same problem and, and, and threshold, the sort of size of element entries versus the largest element entry in the matrix. And you can see that um, when you get to higher wave numbers, about 95% of the matrix is 10 to the minus six down. Um, so it's integration precision down on the leading order terms. So we're actually getting leading order terms and then just sort of almost like numerical noise in the background. And you can throw this away. Uh, so if we keep on just throwing elements of the matrix away, you'll find that you can do that down in this graph, in this case, down to about 20% of the population before it affects either the error or the condition number. And if you keep doing that and you kind of track the point that you require in the matrix for certain accuracy, you find that although the matrix size grows uh, with K squared, which is the top trend here, you find the number of non-zeros you require scales with just K. So we've actually gone down a order of magnitude in scaling as well. So we see that actually the sparsity can occur in high, high frequency BEM as well as KA is increased. And that is the end of our picture.
I'll just draw some little conclusions here um, on another slide. So geometrical acoustics and high frequency bound element method have many synergies. Much has been discovered, uh, but the ideas here are uh, kind of like a roadmap. You'll see that I'm showing you lots of ideas, but no fully functional working algorithm. Um, and there are more challenges to overcome to produce a feasible algorithm, notably to do with efficient integration and things like that. At the start of the talk, I also required and I uh, identified a requirement for an acoustic simulation algorithm that accurately and efficiently calculates low order reflections for the full order bandwidth, because this is where the synergy between geometrical and acoustics, uh, the high frequency band would have some impact. You also want it to be compatible with uh, one of the wave methods where frequencies are low and compatible with the stochastic method for late time high frequencies where modal density is high, which leads us nicely on to DEA in the next talk. I've shown a couple of results from a new boundary integral uh, model derived from energy principles, and this can show suppress internal cavity resonances and produce sparse matrices and be solved on in reflection order like boundary element method, sorry, like geometrical acoustics. So thank you very much.